Hello, everyone. Um, this is Miguel Akwe, your co course director for the course Fundamentals of Natural Resource Governance. I want to welcome you from whichever part of the world you are to Model 4, Mineral Policy and Development Strategy. We've already gone through the various stages um, um, of the mine cycle. UNS have already been exposed to the adverse impact of um, mining and the mitigation um, strategies to minimize the impact, particularly on the environment and the socioeconomic well-being of the citizens, specifically the local communities. Um, we've also had to look at um, um, Model 3, and now here we are at Model 4. During Model 1, I mentioned that um, each stage of the mine cycle requires its own set of regulation legal instruments that governs it to ensure that private investors operate within a controlled and um, in a compliant uh, manner so that their activities and the impact they generate will be optimal to the general good. So today under Model 4, we'll be looking at how some of these legislative um, instruments are developed, specifically the mineral policy, whether now being developed or being reviewed. The processes are not so different from each other. The various processes in developing the strategy, the monitoring um, of the effective implementation of the policy. The objective of this course, of this model, is to expose um, learners to the development or revision of mining policy, as have already been said, as well as the accompanying strategy that is needed to come up with a more effective uh, mining policy. This will not be done in isolation, but as has already been said, this is being done taking cognizance of the various issues that came up in our previous models. So here is the content. We look at the fundamentals of a relevant mineral policy, the processes in developing an effective mineral policy, some of the outcomes that we envisage from a final policy document and the implementation plan. Generally, this is what um, Model 4 will be covering. So first, we want to look at the context that informs the development of a mineral policy. Previously, the development of a mineral policy had been left in the hands of the central government, um, being done by the sector ministry on behalf of government. However, this does not ensure ownership of the citizenry of the mineral policy, hence it makes implementation difficult. Again, Without such um, involvement of other key stakeholders, including the citizenry, it, it undermines the overall inclusion of the mining operation because not all issues are being identified or captured to be addressed or mitigated when the development of such a critical policy is centered by um, at the central government or by the sector ministry or agency. So gradually with the establishment of international regulations, treaties, regional frameworks, governance frameworks, there is a move away from the development of a policy that is done solely by the sector ministry to a more broader consultative 
um, and participatory approach. As you recall, a lot of issues came up during the mind life cycle. There were so many issues when we were dealing with the model two, which was looking at the various impacts, environmental and socioeconomic impacts of mining. So it is very important to consider the various views from diverse stakeholders who affect are, or are affected by the mining sector. Hence the need for a more participatory and a more consultative um, approach to ensure that diverse views are captured in the development of the policies and to ensure that as much as possible, problems from, that, uh, from diverse stakeholders are mitigated um, against without necessarily just focusing on the needs and the gains the mineral operations will accrue to government. The consultation includes um, civil society organizations. It includes um, um, the local communities, the private sector, who are investing their, their uh, monies in the sector, and other key agencies, which also even include um, other sector agencies, government sector agencies, and ministries because we want to ensure that the mining sector is not treated like an enclave, but then it has a broader socioeconomic impact on other economic sectors. And if we have to do that, then to develop a broader mining policy, there need to be consultation among um, other agencies to ensure that the needs and strategies are well integrated in the mining policy. We also have um, parliament participation. That's um, when it comes again, we have the parliamentary, uh, the parliament select committee of mines and energy that oversees the activities of the sector ministry, especially in terms in, in times like this, to make sure that all the necessary issues are well captured and also they, they review it to make their contributions before the draft bill is finally sent to parliament for deliberation and uh, onward approval. So one may say, why do we need a consultative or a broader stakeholder approach? Key is to ensure acceptability or to put it more correctly, ownership of the mineral policy by all stakeholders, including the public. As you already know, usually in our constitutions, it is well enshrined that the mineral resources or any natural resource belong to the people and it is vested in the government to be governed on behalf of the people. So if such natural resources belong to the people, then any regulatory framework or any legislative instrument to manage such natural resources require the participation and ownership of the people to ensure proper accountability and also ensure proper monitoring for the effective um, implementation of such a policy. Okay, we have to meet the needs and aspirations of stakeholders. Because if, the particip if, if stakeholders' participation is undermined, the likelihood is that some of the needs may not be captured or may not be looked at from the perspective of the affected stakeholder. And when that happens, the likelihood of rejection of the policy is very high or pass uh, passiveness among the public would be very high. So for an effective policy, there should, it should meet the needs and aspiration of stakeholders to ensure that stakeholders are empowered through ownership of the policy and also increase the likelihood that the policy will be effective. Because only the state agency will not be able to ensure effective monitoring through the support of all stakeholders 
and also including the local community that will ensure the effective implementation of the policy to realize the desired outcome. When it comes to the implementation and evaluation process, the same is required. Mostly, when a policy is developed through a consultative process, we just end it there and leave the implementation in the hands of the sector agencies. However, it is prudent to consider that the implementation of the policy is as critical as its development. Therefore, in the same way, the implementation of the policy or the monitoring of the implementation of the policy should involve other stakeholders to ensure proper implementation mechanism, proper accountability mechanism, and proper evaluation mechanism. This is not to say that the state agency will not do a good job, no. But then sometimes lack of even staff capacity to enforce compliance, lack of staff capacity to oversee the activities of the diverse stakeholders who are key players within the mining sector will require the involvement of stakeholders, especially local communities. Their participation in monitoring the policy is very key when it comes to the environmental impact because they are there within directly in, um, impacted by the mining activity and it's just an arm's length for them to see whatever is going on in terms of the environmental impact and also the socioeconomic impact. So their involvement in ensuring effective monitoring of the policy is critical. already mentioned why it's necessary to ensure such broader consultation. And without that, they will have a passive um, passiveness from the side of um, non-state actors. Because one, they may not even understand what the policy is about. And two, they do not own it and may see it as a government thing. Although they may have the right um, capacity or they may even have in terms of proximity to oversee the compliance and accountability by other actors. All right, so we move on to some basic elements relevant for um, an effective mineral policy. One will say what is a mineral policy in the first place? Broadly, a policy is like a vision, regardless of where it is, even in a company. It can be defined as the vision of the company, where the company wants to go, the aspirations, the thing that the company aspires to achieve, and the accompanying strategic plan to achieve those aspirations. The policy can be said to be like the guiding principles that oversees the day-to-day -day administration of the entity that is um, developing and implementing it. In our context, the mineral policy, we say, will provide that certainty and clarity in terms of expectations and the responsibilities of various stakeholders within the industry. Because without a well-harmonized policy, it is difficult to tell who does what and by what quantum or debt should that thing be done. The policy creates various limitations for the various actors, both public and private actors in the mining industry for them to be able to ascertain by how much they are supposed to behave, by how much they are supposed to operate and also ensure compliance. This is done to ensure that there's an optimal outcome 
it ensures a good balance between what government can make out of the mineral resources it possesses and also how much company can also make companies interest as well as ensuring the well-being of the citizenry and of course the impact on the environment. Therefore, policy critical as a minimal policy should not just be seen as a government thing, something for government, something for the public officials, but should be seen as something that belongs to the people, hence the need for the consultative process. So there are several aspects of a mining policy. Usually the mining policy have what we call um, the thematic areas. They are usually divided into parts or pillars or whatever name based on the jurisdiction that is developing it. Usually you have a categorized under exploration, the mining phase, the processing phase, taxation, that's the fiscal regime, how the financing, the environment and sustainable development issues. This is to ensure that at each stage of the mining operation, there is clarity of responsibilities, clarity of actions by both public, private and non-state actors to ensure that minerals development are done in a more sustainable manner and the gains according to each party is optimal. It is worthy to note that in most countries, not even most, it looks like virtually all countries do not have just one standalone mineral policy. Usually you find the parent uh, mineral policy and then we have other um, supporting policies that complement the mineral policy to ensure its effective implementation. So you can have um, like the local content policy. You can, in addition to the mineral policy, you can have the local content policy. You can have um, a policy on the environment. You can have policy on the management of um, mineral revenues and a whole lot. Those things provide, those supporting policy documents provide a more um, elaborative approach or provides more highlight to the things that are contained in the parent policy. So whereas you have a mineral policy stating that employment uh, or recruitment in the um, mineral company, the extractive company um, should consider uh, local content or should be sourced from the local community or whatever you may want to put it, or inputs and other raw material should be sourced locally. The local content policy, for instance, can give, can provide a more, a more highlight on how this should be done, especially in the advent where the capacity to produce or meet all the demand of um, input by the mining sector does not exist, then the, the local content policy provides a more progressive approach to integrate the local economy into the sector. All right, so now we come, what are some of the things that need to be considered in the development of an effective mining policy? There are a lot of things, the, the consideration of factors that influence the development of a mining policy are not reduced to this. But these are some of the key issues that influences or that are considered in the development of a good min, uh, mining policy. Number one, 
there should be consideration of the national development agenda of the country. Usually every country has a national development agenda or a national development plan that um, looks at the growth path and the strategies and some of the, the areas or the, the, the goal where the country seeks to uh, go in terms of development within the shortest, um, within short term and even in the long term. So in developing a mining policy, this development plan should be considered. The mining policy should not be developed in isolation, but it should be developed within the context of the national development plan. So it is very critical that development of the mining policy will be situated within the context of the national development plan. Usually you can consider the various streams where the benefits from the mining sector will be harnessed. Traditionally benefits from the mining sector, it's harnessed from the foreign exchange as the exports proceeds, tax revenues, job creation, the opportunity for capacity development, skills and technology transfer, value addition, um, where um, downstream the country is able to um, um, establish beneficiation and upstream provision of raw materials where the country is able to supply the relevant input um, that has been a physical or, or human resource. And of course, provision of infrastructure for other sectors. These are the traditional um, streams of benefits from the, the mining sector. And having known the traditional stream through which you can harness your gains from the mining sector, and also being conversant with the direction of the National Development Plan. It is therefore important to see where these um, um, streams of benefits can properly situate within um, the economy to ensure that the mining sector is not running as an enclave uh, or in isolation from the rest of the economy. It is directly feeding into the achievement of the National Development Plan to ensure poverty eradication and ensure equitable and um, better quality of life for the citizenry. Another factor to consider in the development of a good mining policy is the diverse, the, the diverse interest of the various stakeholders that affect or are affected by the mining policy. During the context analysis, I spoke at length why the need for a more broader and consultative approach in the development of a mining policy. So we've treated the impact of mining. Mining affects a lot of people and also affect the environment significantly. Therefore, it is very important that the needs, the concerns, and the interests of all the individuals, institutions, and the ecosystem generally that are affected or affect mining operations are considered in the development of the mining policy to ensure that the impact on these people and the environment and other um, indicators are well integrated in the mining policy to mitigate their impact, to ensure that the impact is at the minimal level and mining is done in the most sustainable manner in a manner that ensures that there is a good balance between the goal of government that has to optimize the gains from mining activities, the interest of the private sector or private investors who are putting their monies in, whose main interest is the profit, 
and also the impact on the community and environment. When the interests and concerns of diverse stakeholders are considered, it creates this good balance and ensures that at the end of the day, the mining policy drives an optimal mining operations to achieve a well-balanced outcome. So these are some of the um, reasons why the needs of stakeholders um, should be considered and um, in the development of a mining policy. The same should be done in the development of a, an implementation plan that ensures effective monitoring and evaluation of the policy. Another factor that should be considered critically in the development of a mining policy is the environment, the specific environment. Thus, whether the country specific context. I mentioned earlier that the mining policy should not be developed in isolation. Otherwise we will have an, 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 an enclave where participants are mainly public officials and um, private investors and a few politically exposed persons. In that case, means the benefits will accrue to only an elite few to the detriment of the total population, whereas the mineral resources belong to everybody. Therefore, the environment as a country specific contest as usually starts from the constitution of the land. Well, it is in the constitution that is enshrined that mineral resources belong to the state and invested in government to be managed on behalf of the people. Therefore, what the constitution says about natural resources, which includes minerals, should be taken into perspective in the development of a mining policy. This is to ensure that policies within the country that the mining operations are going on are well harmonized and not conflicting. But where we have conflicting policies, it is difficult to know which one is superior to the other. In addition to the constitution, I have mentioned severally that the mining sector should be well linked to other economic sectors within the country. It is therefore important that those sectors that can have a trickle down effect directly or indirectly linked to mining operations should be considered in the development of a mining policy. The the, the manufacturing sector, the services sector, the agricultural sector, and other key sectors, their sector-specific policy should be considered in the development of the mining policy to ensure that in the develop, uh, when you get to sections covering um, linkages, covering um, investment of mineral revenues, covering the provision of inputs to the mining sector. You don't have competing um, or conflicting laws from the other sector and that from the mining sector. That's why it is critical to consider sectorial policies and also critical to ensure stakeholder consultation and interagency um, involvement so that other agencies from other sectors can share their opinion or can share what or how the mining policy can be properly aligned with the existing um, other sectorial policies. Again, since 2015, there was the launch of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 
uh, to replace or to continue the Millennium Development Goals. And within these goals are a set of about 17, uh, yeah, 17 goals. That six has certain specific indicators and targets. All UN nations are assigned or have um, are signatories to the Sustainable Development Goals. Therefore, in the development of such a critical sector policy, like the mineral sector policy, it is important that whilst considering the country-specific context, considering alignment with um, existing laws, it is important to also consider how the mining policy will align with the targets within the Sustainable Development Goals. How do you ensure that the mining policy, the, this, the, the outcome from the mining policy will contribute to the eradication of poverty or extreme forms of poverty, which is the main goal of the SDGs? How do you ensure that the mining sector contributes to reducing extreme forms of inequalities, being it gender or being it income? How do we ensure that the mining policy ensures that there is equitable access to um, opportunities within the mining sector? Many times when we talk about eradication of inequalities, the focus within the context of the SDGs, a lot of focus easily go to gender inequalities. But other forms of inequalities that have been undermined and marginalized is um, uh, persons with disability. Generally, due to the capital or technical intensive nature of the mining sector or the uh, extractive sector, it's so easy to de-emphasize the contribution of persons with disability or the participation of persons with disability in the mining sector. So many times, whereas our mineral policies will encourage local participation or our mineral policies and other um, supporting policy documents will encourage or will uh, bind um, the integration of gender uh, participation or gender sensitive mechanism, little to no emphasis is given to ensuring equal access to information or equal access to opportunities in the mining sector. And this is um, in direct defiance to goal 10 of the SDGs which promotes or which um, yes, promote equal access to economic opportunities by all persons regardless of gender or ability and other um, um, traits. In Ghana, the Africa Center for Energy Policy and other civil society organizations within the structures and uh, various forms of disability groups have been working over the years advocating for the creation of equal access for persons with disability into the extractive sector. We have been working with the Ghana EITI to start publishing extractive sector information on the EITI report in formats accessible to persons with disability, particularly the blind the use of braille versions, the use of um, other accessibility devices, assisting devices, the inclusion of accessibility features in websites, and even the medium of this information dissemination should consider persons with disabilities. So the information will come out in a manner that ensures that access to info extractive information is accessible to all, but it's through access to information that people will be informed to identify 
the various economic opportunities that they can participate in. So all of these things should be considered in the development of a mining, uh, a good mining policy to ensure that the mining sector is contributing to the targets or to the attainment of sustainable development goals. We all know the potential impact of mining activities on the environment. The SDG Goal 13 talks about climate action, how we will preserve aquatic life, how we will preserve the biodiversity to ensure that the environment is safe, the planet is safe. How does the policy ensure that it contains some elements that controls or that ensures compliance to environmental and safety standards to ensure that mining operations do not degrade the environment and destroy aquatic life. But there are mining companies who will be um, compelled to adopt innovative and sustainable measures in their line of operations. So the impact on environment, impact on the ecosystem, the biodiversity will be minimal in attainment of the targets of goal 13. Again, as we know that mineral resources are non-renewable. Therefore, within the context of sustainable development goals, how do we ensure the revenue utilization is done in the most sustainable manner to ensure that even after the depletion of the minerals, future generation will not bear the brunt of environmental degradation and get nothing. But by virtue of the sustainable investment made, even future generations can enjoy benefits from mineral resources and in the use of the utilization of mineral revenues will directly address the needs and concerns of the citizenry to address critical problems in health, education, and other infrastructure to contribute towards the eradication of poverty and improve the living standards of the citizenry. There is also the need to fully integrate mining in the local and regional and national economy. As have already been discussed um, in previous uh, PowerPoint. In addition to the three key um, factors, that one need to consider in the development of a mineral policy. There are other factors that need to be considered. That's the foreign direct investment, the level of the, the investment climate of the country as compared to international best practices. Now we have a lot of indicators, cost of doing business in the country. We have the corruption, perception um, index and all that, all these things influence the decisions of investments, investors. There's also the need to uh, consider compliance with other international standards, environment, safety and health human rights um, standards. We have the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. So it is very critical that the development of a mineral policy take cognizance of some of these factors. Unfortunately, many times in a bid to attract some foreign direct investment in the country, our mineral or mining laws is usually fixated on the fiscal regime. Thus, how do the granting of excessive tax exemptions without even any accompanying feasibility studies 
to ensure the ease of implementation of such tax exemptions or vis-a-vis -vis the impact will uh, the quantum of such um, tax exemptions, how would they give us the needed economic benefit? Many times because the tax exemptions are foregone tax revenues that government could have had. But many times there's a lot of competition among um, resource and that countries for um, investment. And it looks like the popular medium to do it is by granting of excessive tax exemptions. However, a study that um, by ACET has found out that investment decisions are barely influenced by just the granting of tax exemptions, although it is not discounted. But investment decisions regarding the jurisdiction to invest is usually or is also influenced by economic stability within the country, is influenced by how conducive the business environment is, is influenced by a lot of factors other than just tax exemptions. It is therefore important for stakeholders, government and sector agencies in the development of mineral policies to consider improving some of these economic indicators other than just um, using the grant of tax exemptions as a medium to um, influence investment attractiveness. There are some um, country con uh, contest uh, specifics that can also influence the development of the minimal policy. That is access to financing. Usually within our context, we do not do well. Usually access to financing in the mineral um, sector or any other extractive project is sourced from uh, foreign sources. Maybe because our financial institutions do not have um, the requisite capacity to provide the private sector with those huge capital needed to undertake um, extractive projects especially at the large scale, um, at the large scale um, um, area. Also critical to consider is the wealth of geological resources. Again, unfortunately, within our Africa contest, our wealth of geological resources is awfully, awfully um, limited. You have um, that, and so so because of that, usually the the bid for investment attraction into our mining sector is usually starts small from that of exploration, because we don't have um, rich um, wealth of information on our geological um, on, on the geological. Um, and the geological characteristics of the, the, the resources that we have. This is um, widely preached in the African mining vision, the need to invest in knowledge infrastructure because the wealth of your geological resources does having knowledge of your uh, information, deeper detailed information of your natural resources provides the country with leverage in terms of negotiation or in terms of the award of contract. This also de-risk the mining concessions because the depth of knowledge can inform or the depth of existing information possessed by the country can inform or reduce the cost of investment by um, private investors, because if the country already possesses details of the mineable area within the concession, 
It reduces the cost of exploration, having to explore the entire uh, mining block before coming down to identify which area is rich and all that.